So welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. Today I'm joined by Gary Turner. You're very welcome to the podcast, Gary, and I want to begin by asking you to introduce yourself to our international audience. Tell us a little bit about your career to date, what you've been up to, and help people get a real understanding of the journey that you're on. Thanks, Gary. Thank you for inviting me along, Simon. Um, what, what can I say um, that won't bore people? Um, I, I've been in software for um, 30 years, which makes me a bit of a dinosaur, um, but somehow I've managed to catch the next wave every time technologies um, fall by the wayside, and so I'm somehow surviving. Um, I've, I've spent most of my career in probably the most boring category of software you could ever imagine, which is accounting software, not rocket science and not self-driving cars or AI or anything like, like debits and credits and invoices. But it turns out that that's a really important discipline for businesses to be successful. So um, I, I've spent most of my career on that. The last 12, 13 years of my time, I spent helping to build up a business called Zero, which is a new general, not new anymore, it's about 15, 16 years old, but then new generation of cloud accounting software to replace desktop products and server products. And so I established and grew and led Zero in the UK and in Europe for about 12 years. Um, I stepped away from Zero uh, last year, and now I'm on a couple of boards where I'm hope hopefully sharing some of the benefits of my experience with other startups and founders and CEOs. Um, and I'm doing a bit of angel investing and early stage investing as well. So um, I'm still loving tech, still loving software, still loving all of the dynamics and uh, disruptions that um, are, are coming down the track and still smiling after 30 years. Well, Gary, I'm delighted you, you, you're with me today because I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into some of that because uh, like I've been uh, watching Zero uh, from afar for many, many years, pretty much from the beginning. Uh, it was a huge success story coming out of New Zealand and uh, you pretty much set up from scratch a large part of that out of the UK I believe today there are about three and a half million customers. And I think uh, at least a third of that, I think, is down to some of the work you you did initially from scratch, maybe more now. Um, I mean, in the UK alone, it must be heading for about a million customers. Um, yeah, I don't think it's quite reached a million yet in the UK, right. but, but but I suspect it will happen in, in the next while. Um, yeah. I think the last um, UK customer count was 800,000 800, something, so not, not far off a million. And globally, it's over three, there's about three and a half million customers yeah. globally. And so, yeah, I, yeah my, it, it was an, an amazing journey. Uh, I was very lucky to um, have got a ticket for that ride when Zero was a tiny little business. So obviously, I don't have a Kiwi accent, so I wasn't one of the original Kiwis that got the business up and running in New Zealand. But I was the first international uh, leadership hire into Zero when Zero was about 40 people overall. And I think Zero was about 5,000 people and millions of customers. And so it was an amazing privilege to be part of that. Um, and, um, and, and, and I'm still, uh, I guess... D doing many of the things that I love doing in my role at Zero, which is helping to build things. I'm very much um, motivated by taking an idea, taking a concept and turning it into a reality and building it and building it at real scale. And that's something that uh, I had a huge amount uh, of fun doing um, in my time at Zero. And for, for people that that may not know, I know you had, um, you're a mentor at Techstars, but you were in Microsoft, and then you you sort of moved over to Zero, right? Got your ticket. That, like what, that, what 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 prom right. what prompted that? What because you're you're in you were in Glasgow at the time, right? No, no, no. So I, I'm originally from Glasgow. Yeah, uh, but I've been down here. Uh, I'm I'm just about uh, an hour north of London. I've been down right. here for about tw well, twenty two years now. Yeah. Um, I work for another accounting software um, uh, uh, product. Um, which goes way back to the 80s when I was, I think I was still in school when that one was founded um, and spent spent a good bit of time there understanding the software industry, then went to Microsoft. And the reason I went to Microsoft is because Microsoft was on my bucket list of employers. I mean, I grew growing up in the kind of 90s world of technology before the internet, before Google, before Twitter, before all of these companies we're so familiar with today, 
when I began in my career in technology, Microsoft was the company that everybody aspired to. Everybody really saw was being very, very successful. And, and I think I decided in the mid nineties that I, I was going to work for Microsoft one day. Um, and weirdly, and this is how, uh, how, how, how kind of like, Focused that was on that. When I relocated from Glasgow down to the south of England, not to join Microsoft, but to join another software company, my decision, oh, sorry, to take up a role in another software company, my, my, my decision about where we moved to was influenced by the fact that one day I was going to work for Microsoft. So I wanted to be as close to Reading as possible, which is where Microsoft's UK headquarters was. And that was like seven years before I actually ended up working. So there was like a game plan in there, I went to Microsoft, ticked that uh, item off my bucket list, and then I realized a really important, learned a really important lesson, which is there has to be more reason to join something. You have to have a really important why. And my why for joining Microsoft was, it'd be cool. I mean, Microsoft, that's amazing. Then I got there and it was amazing. It was great. But after about six months, I thought like, no, what? What do I do? I've like achieved that. I've ticked that item off my bucket list. And I knew that the world of software was changing. I knew the cloud was going to completely transform the landscape of what it means to build, run, use software. I thought it might happen at Microsoft, but it was happening quite slowly, although Microsoft have since massively embraced the cloud. Um, and I knew the world was going to change. And then one day I got a LinkedIn message from one of the original Kiwi founders in New Zealand of Zero. I'd heard of Zero, but discounted it because it was so far away in New Zealand. Uh, which turned out to be a, a, a bit of a, a miss on my part because when you're in the cloud, it doesn't really matter where you are. And when I when I understood that, that Zero really wanted to get going in, in the UK, it was like a 10-second decision for me. I literally quit my job at Microsoft. Everybody at Microsoft thought I was completely insane, thought I was having a moment, that, that I want to like take some time off and like reflect. And it was like, no, 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 this is, this is where I'm going to go. It's going to be amazing. Uh, see you later. And, uh, and so... I was incredibly lucky to end up at Microsoft and I was incredibly lucky to have an opportunity to then get on to a startup. Um, and, and that fortunately for me, that startup was zero. Yeah. And what a journey that was. So, so help, help us understand a little bit, because th there wasn't an awful lot for zero in the UK at the time. So how did you go about setting i mean setting that up from scratch am i right in saying that i mean there, there wasn't a lot going pretty on. much i think yeah. because like any cloud product you, you can just people just sign up for it people found it i think there were about five or six accounting firms that had found zero and were, were using it and there was a few hundred businesses that had signed up and, and and started using zero and there wasn't really a kind of uk version of zero fill it didn't do vat it didn't do a whole lot of other things it was mostly a generic product um, but the one thing that um, I, I remember I had the sense of when I when I finally um, quit myself and, and got into zero, it felt like everything I'd learned in my career up to that point had been a kind of rehearsal for what I needed to do at zero. So it called upon what I have a very kind of generalist set of skills. I'm commercial. I understand product. I get marketing. Uh, I get strategy. I, I could, I could, a, a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none, and it turns out that that was a really great baseline for me to start from because I got PR, I knew how to build brand awareness, I knew how to get people on board, I knew how to spot and hire great talent, um, and and so it was kind of like I don't know this kind of universal soldier approach to doing everything. So if we launched a new feature, we launched a new product. A conventional leader would have gone, right, I need to get like the, the comms team to go and write a press release or I need to get our agency to go and do a press release and I'll tell them what we need and they'll spend three days on it and then they'll send me the first draft and I don't like it and I'll send it back and maybe in 10 days I'll have a press release and then we can launch that. Whereas I was able to, whenever we did something, I would just write the press release. I would speak to the journalists. I would get the, I'd write the blog posts. I would go on and do the webinar. It wasn't just me on my own, but I, from a kind of management and a functional leadership perspective, I was able to shake my stick at many different things. And I think that gave us a, 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 a real advantage in terms of speed of getting things done because we didn't have this 
bottleneck of depending on many different things. And, and I'd been doing it for so long prior to getting on board with Zero that I was able to just fall back on all that experience I had. Uh, and a real sense of belief that the world was changing, software was changing, and it was a, a huge opportunity to take a product like Zero and capitalize on that. And so a real sense of belief that we were onto something pretty big. Yeah, it's interesting because thinking back to that time, I think other than Salesforce.com, who were very much the software advocates, Microsoft was pretty much a desktop product still at that point. Adobe, I don't think, had made the move, although, you know, both Adobe and you mentioned Microsoft a moment ago, huge successful cloud businesses now in their own right. Um, but back then, it was a completely different landscape, wasn't it? Um it was, and and I, I read a book, um, well, way back in the nineties, um, by Jeffrey Moore called "Crossing the Chasm," which is kind of like the, the 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 basic manual of how to sell, build, and market software or technology, and 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 it was always um, an important part of my thinking. And and when you're taking a product like Zero in the early days, when nobody else really knew what the cloud was, there was more, no point trying to sell it to traditional conservative customers it was like who are the, the 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 weirdos who are the early adopters who are the kind of the minority of the market that's always looking for something new and, and our focus in the first two or three years was really who, where are those people where can we find the maybe maybe five percent of the entire market that will even have a conversation with us let's spend all of our effort finding that five percent and disregard the 95 percent um, and so we spent a lot of time really just finding the people that um, already had a, a degree of curiosity or intellectual affinity for what we were trying to do with Zero, and that, and that was an important part of the first two or three years, definitely. So, you know, I find that fascinating because, you know, when you talk about three and a half million customers now and, you know, the 850,000 customers in the UK and all that, those great numbers... But it's fascinating when you talk, Gary, about finding, you know, people talk about finding the niche or finding that core audience or that sort of persona that you were chasing. And you, you'd obviously identified that early on. And you've also said something else, which I suppose is a little bit in the software industry for some companies, definitely in the tech industry, which was that being able to move fast, being very adaptable early on. But I wanted to maybe expand that now a little bit because... That's great at the start, but obviously your your business scales significantly. So what about when you had to go into Europe or the Middle East and Africa or, you know, you know when you're in South Africa, for example, um, back, was it 2016, 2017, something like yeah. that? Like what, what had to change? Like what did you have to do differently then? Because I, I'd imagine you can't just keep a handle on all that at that point. No, I think um, I guess there's two parts to that question. Um, one one of the things that we did was we really developed a very clear sense, um, or or even like a playbook of of what we needed to do to enter a new market uh, by looking at the markets that we were already in and were successful in, and looked at the key kind of flags or characteristics or the criteria that were supporting our success. And we're fundamental to our, our strategy or go to market model or service model or the size of the market. And then look for other markets that were really close to that because it's really easy to just go kind of like blunderbuss and enter five different markets at once and, and, and speculatively go and try and see if you can make it work. But we had a very clear sense of what, what needed to be in place um, at launch and very quickly after launch to kind of follow that pathway. And so when, when we entered new markets, we always were very much guided by that. Um, and for South Africa, it was very much the same. Uh, and South Africa all, all, almost followed the, the exact foot, footsteps that our other markets followed in terms of rolling out and it was successful for us. But then as a leader, you go for this person who's like writing blog posts, writing press releases, hiring people, going out and meeting customers, helping to close deals, like kind of doing everything in the business as you do at the very beginning, and then slowly handing, handing off hats that you were, multiple hats that you were wearing to people to come in and, and, and then run those functions and run those tasks and build teams as the business scaled. And that, that was something that was actually really, really difficult 
because finding the right talent that's right, not just in terms of their capability, but for the right phase of growth, you, 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 you maybe you employ 10 or 15 people, you're not going to go and hire somebody who's come from a, a major corporate who, who's um, got, got a, a, a coterie of assistants and deputies around them because they'll just come and basically try and replicate their, their corporate structure, which you can't really justify, need nor afford. But then you can't go for people that are too traditional or too um, constrained in their experience because they went, they then will be more conservative and will possibly take some of the risks and see the bigger picture. And so it was really hard to, to find people for the first part. Um, and I think I didn't struggle with it, but I think a lot of founders and CEOs would struggle with giving and delegating responsibility to new people. I loved giving people responsibility. And so I, I think I, I, I was predisposed to being pretty comfortable looking for great people, trusting them, and then getting out the way and, and being there to kind of guide them and guide the collective on the right journey, but not do everybody's work for them. Um, and I love that. And uh, I think, I mean, going from, I mean, there were three of us at the very beginning. And when I finally stepped up my role at zero, I think in the UK, at least it was about 600, 650 people. And I loved every phase of that from, from three to 650, very different challenges watching the business grow and mature and a whole lot of new problems arrive that you have to solve. But I loved every stage of that, but it is a pretty radical transformation that business goes through from being a kind of micro business to a startup, to a scale up and then into a large company. But I loved it. It was fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. There's some great insights in that for people listening. And um, I suppose just to bring it full circle now, because you've obviously got a passion for, helping small businesses. I, I can remember those videos vividly that you used at Zero to help promote the brand. And they were they were very much focused on the user. You know, the user focused heavily and they were very different, dare I say in inverted commas, quirky types in the videos that kind of, you know, you were very zero, no pun intended, but zeroed in on that uh, that target audience. Did those same videos work internationally for you? Gary. Funnily enough, like well, like the first like five or six customer videos we did in the UK, I filmed them. That's like, like, like you just reminded me. I, I did those. Yeah. It was, it was, yeah. and, and they weren't the best videos ever done, but they got the job done. But um, yeah, it was interesting being building a global business that was truly global. So headquartered in New Zealand, but operating in Australia, operating in South Africa, United States, Canada, UK, all over the world. Um like, do, do you use American English on, on your blog? Do you put Z instead of S and organize and organizations? Those are re really interesting challenges for us, having this single channel to communicate to the world through. And videos is a good example of that, where we came up with this kind of like generic, almost not really anywhere kind of like you couldn't identify whether it was London or San Francisco. Um uh, and actually, some and what we, what we often did was we defaulted to having an American accent, because that would be the one that people would probably most closely associate with tech, and that's okay. Like you're used to hearing videos with a tech voiceover or a commercial with a an American uh, voiceover, not a Kiwi or an Aussie or a Brit or a South African. And so we, we actually put quite a lot of thought into how do we uh, like internationalize, localize without creating fifteen different videos. Um, and uh, and of course we did like local ones in each country as well, but it was an interesting challenge trying to get that balance right. Yeah, thanks for sharing that because I, I just you know when you go from sort of one market to many markets, it's a very it's a very different dynamic. It is. But coming back to what I was saying, then just bringing it full circle, you've obviously got a passion for helping small businesses. Yeah, and you're kind of back helping businesses now in a new sort of role. Do, can you maybe share a little bit of that for our audience? Yeah, it stems from my, I, I get a real sense of satisfaction and I feel a real sense of purpose, almost even duty to do, to support, the, do what we can to support small businesses. I kind of grew up in a, a family business that ultimately failed. And I experienced as a teenager what it's like when a business fails. It wasn't my business, it was my parents' business, but they remortgaged the family home. That went, everything went complete catastrophe. And I think that had an indelible kind of impact on me and my values. And that I'm always going to be rooting for the little guy, the small business, the, the, the people that don't have um, two beans to rub together. 
and 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 I then saw my other passion, which is for tech, to enable that. So in equipping small businesses with tech to enable them to thrive, to survive, and avoid the catastrophe that our family business encountered. And that's a huge passion for me. And I channeled that passion through 20, 30 years of my kind of executive career in software and, and laterally at zero. But I'm still following that passion as an investor, as a non-executive board member, as an advisor to, like, to I, I just love it. I just love solving problems. I just love how can we take the next best idea, the next great invention, the next way of building software to solve a whole new set of problems for small businesses. And so I love that. It's a huge, a huge area of focus and passion for me. And 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 so in the last year, I've been, I've, I've done a number of uh, angel investments and early, early stage investments. I'm on a couple of boards of startups and kind of helping them shape and define and, and, and uh, lead their vision and hopefully their success ultimately. And so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very lucky that I'm still able to fulfill my passion, but in a way that, um, uh, is quite different from what I what I used to do as an executive. Yeah, that's that's wonderful, and thanks thanks for sharing that. Uh, so, look, I want to squeeze a couple of other things in as well because I don't want to run out of time. Um, I want to ask you when you take on information yourself, uh, do you do you read books? Do you read white papers? Are you constantly trawling the web? Uh, is it very tech heavy? And also maybe if you read books for a personal perspective, you know, what sort of genre do you like yourself? Uh, so there's only two, there's only two genre of books on my bookcase behind me, business books and biographies. So I love, I love biographies and kind of historical biographies. Um, but, but my, my other uh, genre is business books and, and new ideas and new, either management uh, principles or, management science, understanding how to get the best out of people and teams and organizations, as well as how to build great businesses. And so I, I love podcasts. Like podcasts are probably my primary source of, of, of learning. And I subscribe to a whole bunch of really interesting technology podcasts and, and, and around investing in, in new technologies. Um, I do read a, a good chunk of uh, books as well, um, whether it's audio books or physical books or on my Kindle. I'm inspired by ideas. I'm inspired by new thoughts and concepts. And I follow a bunch of interesting people on social media who who are who are also great kind of um, uh, collectors of ideas or insights. And so I, I have a it's pr it's pretty. I spend quite a, probably a lot more time doing it than I realize. I love it. I, I just love thinking, strategizing, uncovering new ideas and concepts, and then thinking about how do I put them into some kind of practical use. And so all of the above, I think, is the answer to your question, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's amazing now how we can have an audio book one minute and then a, a physical book the next minute and yeah. a podcast the next minute. You know, it is great for, for absorbing information. So thanks for sharing the way that that works for you. A couple of other quick things. Along your career to date, um, or maybe even before you, your sort of executive career in, in zero, was there anybody that you admired in business? Like, is there anybody that you admire today or people that you would have looked up to or that would have inspired you along the journey? It's, it's a, a very predictable answer for somebody um, in, in my line of business, but I, I, I have a huge amount of respect for what Steve Jobs at Apple demonstrated was possible when you think about a coherent narrative, a, a connected experience where every dimension of a product's purpose, how you use it, how you experience it is connected in a way that is just thoughtful and designed in. And I, and I love that. And I think what, uh, what Steve Jobs demonstrated at Apple, you see many businesses now get that. They get, you start with the customer, you start with the problem and work your way back to the product. And then you build a coherent and the best possible experience you can at every touch point. And that's not the way that many software businesses used to operate. People used to start with the product and then go and find a customer for it. You know, they come up with a solution and find a problem. And so Steve Jobs would be the one that I think I, I learned um uh, just by observing how he operated and and how beautiful or elegant um, 
even today, the, a, a, an Apple product launcher or how everything is connected. I love that kind of uh, vertical experience, um, uh, which is a very predictable answer for somebody in my position, as I said. And what what about the the because I I'd agree with with Steve and sort of the aesthetics and the thinking and the the sort of uh, supply chain almost if you like of of how he, he thought through the product and the yeah. service offerings. But what about Tim Cook today? You know, Johnny Ives in there from a design perspective. I know he's he's kind of no longer involved, but Tim Cook now he's sort of more operational and it's it's the most successful, you know, revenue wise company, I think, on the planet. But they're very different people, aren't they? I think, Tim. And they, they are. I mean, and Steve Jobs and Apple would would not have been successful were it not for people like Tim Cook in the engine room operationally. And so you, but that, that again is part of what makes it work you, you you can't deliver the best possible customer experience of any single component of your delivery or your product design or your customer support is in any way not upholding of that promise um but but i think like like i said whether it was at zero or any other company that that has has come to be in the last 20 years following that apple example and, and it's very much a kind of second era of apple thing it's not 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 really um the hallmark of the first phase although apple did design great products but this idea of having a connected customer experience is now it's now like there's books about that stuff you know previously it was just steve jobs's perspective but now anybody can 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 embody that and i think uh, if anything apple are now absolutely locked onto that playbook and and i love the the fact that you've got somebody like, like tim cook um, following that same philosophy um, that m- might have been pioneered by Jobs 20 odd years ago, but uh, anybody can do that now. But it does take a village. You can't just do it on your own. For sure. Um, last couple of things. In terms of advice, is because you were talking earlier about a fa- you know a failed family business and the impact that has on you and how that sort of shapes and, and motivates, I suppose, in, in later life. Um, but is there any advice that you've received along the way that still lives with you today? Or is there anything that you pass on to people that you think is good advice to share? So I, I, there was one piece that I was really lucky. Um, and I think this is this is definitely a good thing, but, but there are some downsides to it. Uh, way early on in my career, I was like 21, 22. I was working in an IT services business in Glasgow. And I, I had just like, it would have been beginner's luck. I had had a, a, a number, a, a great run of successes, landing some really significant deals, um, and uh, through luck more than anything else. And I and I thought, well, I'm just good at this. I don't need to work hard anymore. And I get a right old kick up the backside by my boss, who saw that I had begun to cruise because it was just so easy for me to kind of land deals. But one of the problems is that the minute you start cruising. Well, the minute you get complacent and all of a sudden you go off a cliff. And so he gave me a right good kick in the arse when I was in my early 20s about the importance of not being complacent. And you're only as good as your next deal or your next success or your next project. And that, again, like indelibly baked into my psyche has meant that I'm never, uh, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm not trying to make something 100% as good as it possibly be. I'm, uh, But I am an improve, improver. <laughs> I, 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 I'm how can we take what we have and make it better? And never being satisfied by what you have. That's great. Well done. We've achieved some measure of success. How can we do even better the next time? So this uh, aversion, almost a phobia of being complacent that was kicked into me in my 20s, I think has absolutely guided me through my career because I think it's fair to say that the number one killer of technology companies, whether you're BlackBerry or Nokia or, or anybody that's fallen by the wayside, is complacency. You, know, you get to a position of success and you kind of cruise. And so fortunately for me, I've had this aversion to complacency. The downside to that is that you, I, I think in, there will be times in my career where I have never quite um, celebrated enough or given enough credit to teams about what we have achieved because I'm always on to the next thing. It's great, put your feet up for 15 minutes, light a cigar and get right back to it. And that I, I think in the main has been a great thing for me. And that advice I got has really shaped my career. But I've learned as I've got older that you 
don't be complacent but but don't drive everybody into the ground and don't celebrate when you when when you when you win yeah that that's equally important thanks for sharing that that's great advice and probably a a great theme for a book you know <laughs> that's sort of, uh, that sort of advice um so look as we record this we're we're sort of beginning a new journey on the the global discussion here ourselves but when it comes to your own passion when it comes to the year ahead when it comes to things that you're focused on, what does that look like for you, Gary? I have a lot of unanswered questions in my head right now. Um, having been in the industry for as long as I have, I think I'm pretty good at spotting when the tide is turning, when the landscape is going to change. Uh, and I have that sense right now, whether it's AI and some of the amazing demonstrations you've seen whether it's kind of um, prompt-based uh, art generation AI or text-based chat GPT and the role that AI plays, as well as the post-pandemic reality of what it means to run a business. Um, the whole thing about flexible working existed before the pandemic, but it's now like baked in. Um, what does it mean to be productive? I saw that Shopify this week have basically instructed their teams to to, to cancel every recurring meeting that has more than two people in it because it's really easy in a large organization just to be in meeting after meeting after meeting and so i think that there are a number of questions that everybody's collectively asking that nobody has the answers to yet whether it's a technological shift or a kind of working um kind of reality shift and, and my sense is that in the next 10 years we'll be in a very different place to where we are at the moment and so i'm Kind of, I don't have the answers. I have some of the, the, the bits of that jigsaw, but I'm, but my kind of enthusiasm for change and disruption is absolutely alive at the moment, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of spotting these new patterns as they emerge, and jumping onto that next wave, and 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 that's obviously a, a, a part of where I am spending my time investing as well. So I think that it's all bets are off. It's all going to change again. Is is my is my kind of summary? I think. I love that, Gary. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Thanks so much for that insight. Um, so look, uh, before we wrap up, I, I, you know, I just want to make sure that we've covered some of the key topics today. Is there anything that you're focused on or is there anything that you'd like to share with our audience? Or, you know, if somebody wanted to reach out and get in touch with you, what's the best way of finding you? I'm on, I'm on Twitter at Gary Turner. Um, but I must have mentored or coached about 30 CEOs and founders in the last 12 months. And one of the things I recognized was that um, every time I did a Zoom call, they, they, like half the questions that people were asking me <laughs> were the same questions that everybody asked me. And so I resolved because I'm, I think I'm fundamentally lazy as well. And I love like being efficient. I thought I know I know to solve that problem. So I've started a newsletter where I'm basically now all of the basics I'm now pushing out um, two or three times a month in a newsletter about all the things I learned. And so I've started a newsletter, which is free. The link to that is on my social profile. I'm on LinkedIn as well at Gary Turner. Um, I love talking to and connect with people with great ideas. Um, I, I love ideas. I love strategy. I love taking a problem, flipping it on his head, looking at it from a different perspective, finding solutions that nobody, is, nobody else is going to find. And so I've also learned that I'm a lot of my thinking is I think through my mouth, which is hopefully obvious, you know, after 30 minutes of listening to me rambling. And so I love great conversations with smart people. So if anybody wants to connect, find me on social media and love to jump on a call. Well, that's great. And uh, certainly recommend people signing up for the newsletter then um, if you'd like some more insights from Gary. But look, that brings us nicely to the end. It's a great point to finish on. Um, thanks to everybody who's been listening or watching this episode of the Global Discussion with Gary Turner. Uh, make sure that you follow, like, subscribe, do all the usual things that you do when it comes to podcasts. And I hope that you'll join me again for some more discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. So thank you very much indeed, Gary. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you, Simon.